you know, we probably saved the world from uh, uh, a, a horrible experience under the Nazis and the Japanese. They had some strange designs on, on the world and young people uh, would find it hard to believe what might have happened to them. But later on in my story I can tell you some of the things that make me feel the way I do. Now, right, <clears throat> right after I graduated from Naugatuck High School in 1942, I went into the service. Many of my classmates went in prior to that because Pearl Harbor uh, was bombed my senior year. And a lot of them left almost uh, immediately. The, the whole country was angry at the treachery and, of the Japanese, and uh, patriotism was at an all-time high. But uh, <clears throat> my, my mother made me uh, wait longer than I wanted to. In those days, you, uh, if you went in under 18, you needed your parents' signature. And my mother wouldn't give it, probably because there were four from her family already in the service, including you know, her husband and my sister and brothers. So she had even uh, tried to get a deferment for me. But uh, shortly after I turned 18, in October, I went into the service. And I was sent up to uh, Camp Edwards, Massachusetts, uh, in an anti-aircraft anti artillery unit. Uh, people say, is that what you asked? And uh, I tell them that during wartime, uh, what, what you asked for was not listened to very often. Uh, you were put in uh, a unit that needed people, so you went in probably in blocks. I would say the, uh, the group of us, uh, maybe six or seven hundred of us, went together. We were in Devons at the uh, place that we were inducted, and we went as a group to, uh, uh, to Camp uh, Edwards and formed the 110th. So even though I had asked for a different assignment, that didn't make any difference. Well, <clears throat> the first thing the military does when they get you in the service, I don't know if it's like that now, but I imagine it is, is they have to get the civilian out of you. And they have to get you used to obeying orders, uh, knowing what the ranks are, who is superior to, to whom. Uh, for an inductee like myself, it doesn't make any difference because anybody from one stripe to a star, you obeyed, you know, without question. And that was one of the first things they tried to do, was to, uh, to get you used to taking orders. Uh, the thing then was that if somebody of rank told you to do something and you didn't like it or you couldn't understand why, you were told to do it and complain later. I wonder how many young people, you know, could adhere to that. Do it first and then complain. <clears throat> Most of the people today complain, complain, and try to get out of it. But that doesn't go in the military because someday uh, <clears throat> an officer is going to tell you to do something extremely dangerous or something you don't want to do. and. Uh, without hesitation, you're going to do it. So that was uh, the first thing we learned, mil military discipline. The next thing, of course, was to get your, your strength up. And they did that by mul multiple exercises every day, uh, marches, runs, uh, all types of physical activity. <clears throat> and then, of course, was to understand the makings of the gun that you were going to be on. And that was our training on a, <coughs> excuse me, a 90 millimeter gun, a very versatile weapon. Uh, had a range of about five or six miles, and uh, basically used for high flying uh, airplanes. And it's a very intricate uh, piece of equipment. And uh, 16 men on a gun crew. We all had to learn our our jobs so that we could uh, do them in a pitch dark or in pouring rain or any type of weather. We learned each other's jobs. 
in case you know someone was taken out of action and <clears throat> that was uh, that was the extent of basic training first of all to learn military discipline secondly to get yourself in physical shape and to learn the intricacies of your weapon now after that was accomplished uh, we were ready to uh, <clears throat> you know to get into action and about uh, November we left uh, we left Camp Edwards and went down to Kilmer, New Jersey and uh, you know there we started to get ready for a deployment you know we learned uh, all kinds of, uh, of things to do on the high seas and uh, how to store our equipment properly and, and then uh, a couple of days before Christmas in 1943 uh, ac actually yeah, 1943 uh, <coughs> we were taken by truck and when uh, we got off the truck we saw this huge ship we hadn't seen the likes of anything like that in our lives. It was the Queen Mary, the largest ship in the world at that time. And we were told later that there were about 18,000 troops on board and a couple of thousand of uh, English personnel because the, the Mary was a, a British ship and run by the British. So we sailed out of New York Harbor past the Statue of Liberty and uh, the first strange voice we heard was from the captain and uh, the captain came over very loud and clear and introduced himself to us and told us in no uncertain terms, my job is to get this ship safely to port. I'm not interested in your comfort or safety but you better take care of it yourself. Uh, should you fall overboard, you know, forget about it. We don't stop. Uh, it wouldn't do us any good to stop anyway because to stop a ship that size would take a couple of miles anyway and you'd be shark baked by then. So <clears throat> uh, if you were sick or uh, you know, had other problems, your, your company officers will take care of it. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in my ship. So that was rather a rude awakening. Uh, there were a lot of other rude awakenings that were to follow. It was not at all comfortable on board that ship. As you can imagine, a ship with 18,000 plus two, 20,000 plus people uh, in peacetime, that ship uh, accommodated probably less than 2,000 people comfortably. Uh, we had, uh, we were billeted in a room that uh, we were told was a former library, and there probably were 30 of us in there, crowded into bunks made from pipe and canvas and rope, uh, <clears throat> for six or seven high. You rolled into your bunk and the guy above you, his rear end was about two inches away from your nose, so uh, you didn't you know you couldn't move around too much and then there were two men assigned to each bunk not at the same time of course but you were to be in your bunk or bunk area 12 hours a day and then you were to be out on the deck or having your meals of the other 12 hours and that was strictly enforced now it, it took you most of 12 hours to get fed twice because the lines were long uh, you had your mess kit, you, uh, you walked through the cafeteria line and there the guys with these big spoons would just slap something in your mess kit. If they were serving dessert, uh, don't be surprised if that was served first and your mashed potatoes went on top of it. Uh, <coughs> as I said, uh, you didn't get on board to eat, you got on board to get to your destination. The, uh, <clears throat> the cafeteria was just a series of long troughs and you didn't sit down. You stood up in front of one of these troughs and put your mess kit down and started to eat. Now when the ship would roll, sometimes your mess kit would slide two or three men in either direction. 
and you'd have to wait for the ship to right itself to get your mescara back. And more than occasionally, somebody down the line would upchuck. So you can imagine what did to your, that did to your appetite. Again, fortunately, it was only four days, uh, probably five, five and a half, by the, if you count the time it took to get on and off. But the, the trip itself, I think, was about four days. It went without escort because we were told the ship was faster than any German submarine. And it would take several torpedoes <coughs> to sink it. Well, we arrived in, uh, <coughs> in Glasgow, Scotland, uh, the only place that Queen Mary could, uh, could dock. And we were greeted by a bunch of American and English uh, Red Cross workers who did the best to greet us and make us comfortable with coffee and donuts and these little uh, bags of goodies, cigarettes, toothbrushes, stuff, <coughs> stuff like that, candy bars. And then we were put on board these trains. The blinds were drawn tight so you couldn't see anything. And I don't know how many days or how long we were on this train, but it seemed endless. And <coughs> we finally uh, reached our destination and uh, again we disembarked. We had to wait uh, hours for our, our bags, uh, you know, to catch up with us because we had nothing but uh, the clothes on our back during all that trip. <clears throat> but finally things came together and we found ourselves uh, billeted in this old English home. So many of the English people gave up their homes for the uh, American troops. And uh, it was uh, quite a gesture on their part. The home we were in was a real uh, fancy estate, and there must have been, I don't know, 15 or 20 of us there. And the gardener of that estate was the only person left. The people who owned it and their family had moved into the countryside someplace. <clears throat> and there we uh, made ourselves comfortable and uh, got down into the routine business of being retrained, <clears throat> again on the weapons that uh, had been provided for us. And that went on, again, for several months. Uh, when we arrived in England, it was, uh, say, early January. And if you recall, the invasion was uh, in June. So during that uh, six-month period of time, you know, we trained, learned about the English customs, later on about the French customs, when we found out that was our probable destination. But uh, it was much more intense, the training. Uh, everybody was much more serious. And before too long, we, uh, we disembarked again and went down to this uh, loading station in Exeter, England, and where there were thousands and thousands of American troops and vehicles of all types, sizes, shapes. And there we practiced uh, amphibious uh, loading and landing. Our, our guns were big and pulled by a tank. So since we were going to be deployed in three or four feet of water and make our way to a shore, everything had to be waterproofed, but in such a way that it could be stripped very quickly. So again, it's a tedious cast, task and uh, we became more efficient on it as each time we tried it. We were put on board ship at least twice, maybe three times, each time thinking this was it, but then after a day or two out, a few miles out in the ocean, they just returned us for more training uh, <coughs> at our campsite. Everything was uh, very hush-hush there. Uh, security was unbelievable. You couldn't talk to anybody outside of your outfit. Of course, there were no passes. <clears throat> and finally, uh, we got on board our LST. That's a landing ship tank. That's the type of uh, vehicle that we were going to uh, go across the channel on. It's a large ship. And ironically, 
the LSD 510, the ship we went on, is now a ferry boat out of New London. So if any of you uh, people want to see what my ship looked like that took me to battle, it's still there in New London. And it's uh, about a two hour ride over to uh, Long Island. <clears throat> my wife and I have taken the trip a couple of times you know, just for nostalgia, and uh, one time several of my buddies that are in the area, we went together and were treated loyally by the, uh, the crew. If you go, you'll see a plaque up in the captain's quarters with uh, the name of the 110th, all of us. And you look for Frank Johnson, you'll see him, he's there. A uh, very proud memento. But anyway, <coughs> Uh, it was uh, pitch dark when we rolled out, and uh, our our officers were were being briefed by the higher commands away from us. And early in the morning, they got us all together and gave us whatever information we needed to get ready to do our job. Now, when people ask me about the war in general, I tell them you know more about it if you read books because. World War II, to me, was only like a couple of football fields in front of me. Uh, <clears throat> I was never asked uh, for any advice or anything else, and uh, so whatever my task was, uh, that's what I did for, for the whole war, and I never really knew the overall picture. But that's all I had to do, was just to do what I was told and to take care of business uh, in front of my <clears throat> my field of vision. I'd say about halfway across the channel we knew something big was going on <clears throat> because there were thousands of ships. There hardly a space in the water without some type of craft. And when you looked up at the sky you couldn't really see too much sky because of the planes. Thousands of them flying back and forth. Uh, <clears throat> We said, boy, somebody's taking an awful pounding over there. And we began to hear the sights and sounds of war as we approached the, uh, the, the, <clears throat> the coast of France. Again, the time was uh, June 6, 1944. We were told that we were supposed to land early afternoon on that day. <clears throat> the, uh, the infantry and ranger units uh, started to land around 6 o'clock that morning, and they were supposed to secure the beachheads, clear a path to the designated area where we were supposed to set up our guns. But <clears throat> on Omaha Beach, where we landed, that wasn't done until the next day. So we spent the first night probably a half a mile out into the, <clears throat> I can't call it a harbor because there really wasn't a harbor, but but just uh, about a half an hour away from land. And that was a s eerie, shaky feeling because all night long a small fire, enemy fire, uh, could be heard not just in the distance, but you could hear it bouncing off the side of your ship. You looked around and you saw ships exploding uh, all about you and you were wondering when that was going to happen to your boat. You looked out in the water and there were just filled with debris, blown up uh, ships, and <clears throat> then you saw all kinds of bodies, floating bodies uh, already starting to be bloated. One of the thoughts I had was every one of those American soldiers had trained like I did for months and months and maybe years, uh, went through all that uh, training and uh, hard times, and now here they were dead in the water with, without even a chance to fire their weapon. But uh, as you'll see in my <clears throat> stories later on, that that's what makes war such a terrible thing. Well, <clears throat> in the morning, our ship was supposed to get in close to the shore, drop this to the front, and we were supposed to ride off in a couple of feet of water. But they couldn't do that. There was so much debris uh, in, in front of it that 
they couldn't get any closer than they were the night before. So they had to float what they call a rhino, which is a large platform. Uh, looked like a board strapped to 50 gallon oil drums with an outboard motor on the back of it. And they loaded uh, <clears throat> uh, one tank and gun and one uh, truck and uh, our crew, probably, you know, 20, 25 men. <clears throat> it was, took care of, the rhino took, that's all it would take care of. And we put putted the shore. Again, we could hardly wait to get to shore, which is strange because that's where the enemy was. But we felt so vulnerable right out there in the open, uh, and that we couldn't do anything to fire back. When we hit the shore, uh, <clears throat> as we were going ashore, we were taking the cosmoline, the grease and covers off our weapon because uh, it looked you know, rather obvious that it wasn't going to get too wet. The rhino took us right up into the sand. <clears throat> and then uh, when we hit the beach, we were directed by uh, beach masters uh, and by flags, coated flags. Uh, some of them had our, our outfit uh, <clears throat> name on it. So you could see the work that had to be done by uh, combat engineers and so forth during the night. And we were hustled up this very small path. I think it was a makeshift path. Certainly what didn't look like any road that had been established. And right at the top of the hill uh, was the emplacement where <clears throat> we were to set up our, our guns. Now normally uh, a battery consists of uh, the, excuse me, the battalion uh, consists of uh, four gun batteries and a headquarters battery. So we usually fire you know, in cooperation of the other three, three gun batteries. I was in battery B and uh, battery C was within seeing distance but uh, the other two batteries for one reason or another uh, either hadn't made it or were sent someplace else. And it wasn't until many, many days later <clears throat> that we became a complete unit again. But anyway, I would say within an hour after we landed and set up, we were firing at the enemy and doing an awful lot of damage. And they in turn were doing some damage to us. One of the first things I remember is my gun officer saying uh, <clears throat> to us, remember, if you can see the enemy, they can see you. So, you know, watch your butt. And uh, again, it wasn't too, too long before, you know, we were missing people and uh, we were beginning to realize that what war is really about. Now, the effectiveness of our gun, the 90 millimeter, <clears throat> usually takes place out of your sight, your, your vision. Uh, we were firing at targets that <clears throat> we, most of the time we couldn't see. We were being directed by spotters or by the uh, radar and high, high finders for planes. <clears throat> but in the early part of the war, we did fire at tanks and you can see them. And boy, you better, you better get to them. Because if you, know, if you don't, they were going to get to you. So uh, beach fighting went on for, I don't know, a couple of weeks, I guess, and then uh, <clears throat> we moved not very far. Uh, the whole battalion regrouped, so we were one body again, four gun crews. That's 16, 16 uh, guns, because each battery had four 90 millimeters. So that's a very potent force. And we were called upon by everybody and his brother for support. You know, an infantry rifleman, it shoots one bullet, but that uh, 90 millimeter could could take out a building or a tank, or and you have when you have 16 of them, you can imagine that uh, our <coughs> our infantry and uh, supporting groups were happy to see us at home. And conversely, the enemy was very anxious to get rid of us. So, uh, as I say, it was. 
It was quite an eventful process. After a couple of weeks, the Germans withdrew when they knew they had lost the beachhead. They withdrew to a large town called St. Lo. And the St. Lo was the second major battle of the war. And uh, <coughs> it, uh, it was a town probably the size of Waterbury, I imagine. And we were there four or five days just firing shell after shell after shell into the city. Airplanes were coming over around the clock, dropping all kinds of ordnance. Uh, as I look back now in hindsight, I, I, I think of the civilian population that was in that city. A few days later, we rode through St. Lowell. I was sitting on the top of my tank and one of the highest structures I saw was a, a chimney of a house. The whole town was just leveled. Uh, <clears throat> uh, very, you know, a, a very, very scary sight for us. Then, uh, <clears throat> after St. Lowe, we moved from site to site, a lot of open space. Uh, as we started clearing the uh, western front of uh, France, small airfields were being built so that the planes wouldn't have to fly the English Channel. They could, <clears throat> they could land and reload and refuel and take off for their targets, you know, much more <clears throat> conveniently. But we were given the job of guarding those airfields. So that, that was our assignment for I'd say probably 50% of the war, we were guarding something, ammunition dumps, uh, railroad crossings, airfields, uh, headquarters, uh, things like that, that were vulnerable targets. And <clears throat> I'm very happy to say we did our job. One night in particular, there was uh, a, a flight of German bombers. The Germans only flew at night. Uh, when they felt a little safer. But there was a, a, a flight of German bombers that came over, and again we were told that there were about 17 German uh, planes in this uh, flight, and we accounted for <coughs> 11 or 12 of them. So uh, our gun was uh, really something. And that's the way it was all during the war. Uh, people used to brag about the German 88, how accurate and destructful it was. And uh, we later on found out it wasn't that they were, the gun was better, it's just that their orientations were better. We captured a German pillbox one time, and inside the fortifications was the azimuth and elevation to all the sites around, trees, bridges, houses. So all they had to do was read the, uh, <coughs> the trajectory on the already established, uh, put that on the gun and they could knock off a tank coming across the bridge with one shot. Whereas we often had to fire two or three to get oriented. But anyway, that uh, that went on for, you know, quite a few weeks. And <clears throat> the next major battle was the liberation of Paris. That's major battle number three. And <clears throat> we were told, again afterwards, that we were one of the first American units that came in on the north side of Paris. And we came in with the French 2nd Armored Division. And we, uh, as we moved into the city, there was, of course, the major, uh, the bulk of the German army had, uh, had left, but there were snipers, there were all kinds of, uh, of even French civilians that had learned to side with the Germans. Remember, the Germans had occupied France for seven years, and <clears throat> so sniping became the, uh, the thing we had to worry about. Were there any French snipers? 
Hmm? Were there any French snipers that would shoot? Yeah, well, some of, them, uh, some of them were Frenchmen, yes, that, uh, you know, had kind of became quasi-Germans during that seven-year period. But also the, the French Parisians, uh, the French underground, they, uh, they did a lot of cleanup. They knew the area. They knew where these Germans were. And we had to be careful because, uh, you know, they didn't have uniforms. The French army did, but these were civilians who had been harassing the Germans all during the occupation. And they just had regular regular clothes, and uh, when they confiscated weapons, uh, they just went wacky. You know, they were so happy they'd shoot up in the air, and this, and uh, once or twice they had confiscated German uh, trucks and everything, even a German uh, tank, small tank, and they'd be riding down the street with it, celebrating it. You know, when you know we would see it, then. Again, that's an enemy equip piece of equipment. And so we had to be doubly careful and make sure that it just wasn't some uh, French Parisian celebrating. Uh, uh, one of the strange sights that uh, we saw was uh, one day there was a, a street demonstration, and uh, I didn't see it, but some of my buddies did, and there were a half a dozen German women who had been stripped naked and their heads shaven. And we were told that these are women who fell in love with German soldiers and uh, in order to lead a better life, because the Germans had everything, uh, they, you know, became part of the German effort. And when the Germans left and everything, the, uh, the citizens, the French citizens were so angry at them that uh, that's uh, how they treated them. <clears throat> that was one thing. Others, others uh, we were told, some of the men were hung. Uh, again, uh, we didn't have any part of the policing of Paris. Our job, I don't think I told you, our job when we moved in, the Germans had set up this anti-aircraft unit in a park. And our job, we had to pull their guns out and put our guns in. So we became the established uh, <clears throat> protection for Paris from the air and from afar. And uh, the uh, American MPs and everything were the ones who were trying to bring some type of peace and order to the city. We were there seven days and it was quite an experience. Uh, we had to put up a barbed wire fence around our unit to keep the French civilians out. They were so happy to see us, especially the young girls. Uh, they wanted to meet some of these young American guys. And <clears throat> uh, I'll tell you, it was quite a sight. I was ni 19 years old, and uh, people used to ask me, what country had the best looking women? And I would tell them the country I was in at the time. And uh, as I say, it was, uh, it was a very happy time. But all good things have to come to an end. And after uh, seven days, we thought we were going to stay because we had heard General Eisenhower and his staff were going to move into Paris and that was going to become their headquarters rather than London. <clears throat> but uh, one day we heard the rumble of trucks and all these two and a half ton trucks came rolling into our outfit with uh, loaded with uh, fresh American soldiers, nice new uniforms, and uh, they jumped off the truck and we were told to move out, that these guys were going to take over our positions, and uh, we were moved to uh, Marseille, and uh, <coughs> where we had to learn some new equipment. They had made some modifications in the old 90 millimeter, and uh, we spent a couple of weeks familiarizing ourselves with this new equipment and then off again we went into battle. And those guys that just got off the boat, we were told, spent the rest of the war in Paris. <clears throat> but uh, that's the kind of luck I've always had. 
Anyway, that was battle number three. Now, battle number four, you people all know about it. It's called the Battle of the Bulge. And one of the most horrifying things about that battle is it was in the dead of winter. You no know, war is bad enough in good weather, but uh, if you can imagine trying to fight it in below zero temperatures when you couldn't change your underwear or socks or uh, you get up in the morning, brush the snow off your blankets, and uh, sometimes your equipment would freeze. <clears throat> you would have to spend time, you know, uh, getting uh, the frost off it and so forth, especially the vehicles. Uh, very little, uh, very little anything hot, hot water to bathe, hot, to, hot water to have a cup of coffee with. Uh, it was uh, most, most uncomfortable and unbelievable. Many of the troops had frostbite, their, their toes froze, and they had to be evacuated, and uh, invariably their toes would be cut off and they'd be no good for the military. They were sent home. <clears throat> I could go on and on and talk about the, you know, the, uh, the seriousness of it. I avoided several weeks of it because I came down with uh, pneumonia and uh, that developed into what they called yellow jaundice, which is an infectious disease. <clears throat> I was evacuated all the way back to, uh, to London for a couple of weeks. And I was very fortunate in getting back to my own unit because after you left the hospital over there, they put you in what they call a replacement depot. And there, any organization that needed men, they just sent you to them. But uh, luckily, uh, my outfit was uh, not too far from uh, where the uh, repo depot that I was in. And <clears throat> when I found out where it was, uh, I had the chaplain, you know, contact them and tell them where it was, and they sent a jeep for me. So the Battle of the Bulge was long and hard and uh, horrible, and uh, you people have read the story of uh, Bastogne and General McAuliffe telling the German general when they asked, were asked to surrender, he said nuts. General Patton marched his troops through stormy, stormy weather a uh, hundred miles or so and saved the day. Uh, the weather was in favor of the Germans for the first week cloudy, overcast, the planes couldn't fly, and that's what gave Germans the break they needed. But once the weather cleared, they were sitting ducks. And our, uh, our air superiority just flew over in droves and picked them off, and uh, <clears throat> it was a slaughter. So that was the fourth battle. The last battle was the Raymagen Bridge which was the last bridge across the Rhine River, the main entrance into the heart of Germany. And the Germans try to protect that bridge and try to keep the, uh, the Americans from it. Uh, we were sent right up on uh, the highest point overlooking that bridge to protect it from bombers and uh, <clears throat> you know situations like that. Now, uh, can you turn that off for a minute? I'm going to So <clears throat> our last major assignment was the fifth battle of the European war, uh, the Battle of the Remagen Bridge. And <clears throat> Germans were trying to destroy the bridge, slow our progress. Uh, we were there defending it. Uh, down below us were infantry and tanks and uh, the Germans were shelling it and then they were sending planes over trying to bomb it and that was our major objective. And for about three days uh, we, we had heavy fighting and <clears throat> the Americans crossed the bridge, were able to protect it, we kept the Germans away, the f planes. The Germans had developed a jet plane by then, the first time we ever saw one. And it was unbelievable that the difference in speed. 
but the thing was the Germans had developed the plane, but they didn't have time to, to develop the pilots. And the pilots were not that, that good at flying that plane. <clears throat> it was something that just too good for them. So uh, right after we crossed the, the Remagen Bridge, we went into a German town, Schmaler Lincoln. And there was a big German hospital there. And our first assignment was to guard this hospital because the Americans became very interested in, <clears throat> in finding uh, German officers and German civilian people who were directly responsible for all the atrocities that happened during the war. And they were sure that uh, there were <clears throat> some of them in that hospital. So we had to guard everybody going in and out and making sure nobody escaped. <clears throat> but the thing I remember about that particular duty was when we moved into that town, uh, we were standing uh, outside the building and the captain came by and said <clears throat> uh, to each gun crew, again a gun crew, 16 to 18 guys, you take that house there, you take this house there, and give the people two hours to get out. And so we did, that's uh, <clears throat> captain's orders. So we went over and knocked at the door and told them uh, in broken German and, uh, you know, out, you know, roust, whatever the words were, we're taking over your house as long as we're here. Well, I want you people to think about that, because I think about it quite often. As I'm sitting here with Sean and we're looking at all my souvenirs, supposing that had happened here to the enemy, how many of these souvenirs would be left when I came back to them? They'd all be on their way <coughs> home to somebody's, become somebody else's souvenir. And the house itself uh, was, we didn't purposely destroy it, but, uh, you know, we didn't make beds or we weren't careful about, you know, <coughs> cleaning the floors or, and it was really horrible. It, that's a non-military thing, but again, that's, war is just as bad for the civilians as it is for the, the military. I used to watch lines of civilians going through our garbage cans after the war trying to salvage food. All the infrastructure of those cities were destroyed. No sanitation, no transportation. Uh, <clears throat> No way to get food except what was brought into them by trucks from the USOs and so forth. It's horrible on them. <clears throat> but anyway, that was our first assignment, and after that we moved out. And the second assignment was watching roads. Uh, the Germans during the war had that they would capture a country or <clears throat> a town, would take most of the able bodied men and women and bring them into the heart of Germany to work for them, either in the fields, in the factories, uh, any, any type of work that would free a German to fight. And they were called DPs, or displaced persons. And after the war, they wanted to get home. And they were supposed to wait until they were interrogated and checked for health problems. And uh, then they would be offered transportation to get back home, if there was a home. Uh, invariably, many of those homes or cities were destroyed, too. But a lot of them were impatient, and they were going to walk <coughs> hundreds of miles, maybe. And so we would be stationed at the major intersections, and we would have to stop these groups. They always traveled in groups, maybe, uh, uh, you know, a group of uh, three or four, maybe 15, and we would have to stop and interrogate them, see if they have proper papers, uh, you know, whatever was necessary. And <clears throat> so we would stop them, and uh, one of the things we did was we would delouse them. We had these spray cans filled with DDT, and uh, because they, they had been living in deplorable conditions for years, and we would spray them. 
to try to kill any lice or bugs they might have. <clears throat> and there are two, two funny stories I remember there. One about a group of them down in a pond with, trying to fish with whatever they could muster to fish. My buddy and I went down and we took a, a, a German hand grenade that we had and we moved them back and threw it in and every fish that was in the pond came floating to the top. And these people were jumping in with their clothes and grabbing them and smiling. And so that was one of my <coughs> heroic efforts for the DPs. The other one, of course, you can imagine is uh, it's, it's interesting to us and kind of devious, but uh, <coughs> whenever you know there'd be a, a young young lady, a young girl going through the line, we'd make sure that we gave them an extra spray of DDT, you know, we'd tell them to open up their clothes, and uh, we used to get a big kick out of that. But uh, <coughs> we were waiting to be amused. The war was weighed heavily on our hands, and uh, as I say, when the war was over, we kept busy. And then we were sent to Marseille. <coughs> Uh, the war was over in April. I think it was July. We were <coughs> we were sent to Marseille, which is on the Riviera uh, in the Mediterranean Sea, and we were told we were going to be, you know, get ready to go back home and be discharged. But all of a sudden, they started retraining us, exercising, going through manuals and uh, all kinds of stuff that would, didn't sit very well by us. And rumor told us that <clears throat> we were now getting ready to be shipped to Japan. Uh, Germany was gone and now Japan had to be taken. And Japan was uh, hundreds of islands. Each island had to be taken uh, separately and as each island was taken they needed air protection, anti-aircraft protection and so we were told we were in need, great need. And again, you can imagine that didn't sit very well with us. You know, how lucky can you be? But uh, they say that was in July and August, the middle of August. My good friend Harry Truman gave permission to drop the atomic bomb. And after two, two bombs of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Jap the Japanese surrendered. <clears throat> and of course we weren't we weren't deployed to Japan at all. We probably had another month of training <clears throat> before we would have been. You can imagine what I tell people when they tell me, should we have dropped the bomb? I can tell them I don't think I'd be here if they didn't. But anyway, uh my military experiences have started to close about then. We, uh, I think uh, in September, it was September before we were given a, <coughs> a ship. We were discharged by a number system. Uh, you, you got so many points, actually the point system they call it. You got so many points for each battle you were in, so many points for each medal you earned, so many points for this and that. And the people with the highest points were discharged first. And our unit was pretty high up there. We had accumulated quite a few points. So we were, you know, pretty much from that high group from Marseille. But one of the things they did, before we got on board ship, they gave us back pay. We, in the military, you're always, uh, you're always being paid behind. Not that you could do anything with the money anyway. And we hadn't been paid for a couple of months. And so before we got on board ship, they gave us, I think, about two months' pay that they owed us. And what a stupid thing that was, because what do you do on board a ship for six, seven, eight days? I don't have to tell you, but the word is gamble. So some of the guys walked off that ship, uh, multi-millionaires, and guys like myself walked off broke. And <clears throat> uh, when we talk about it with my buddies, they say, now why in the world did they have to pay? Why couldn't they have paid us when we hit the state? So 
you know, we'd have a couple hundred bucks to <clears throat> but anyway, uh, when we landed at Camp Kilmer, the same place we embarked from, uh, <clears throat> there were these enormous mess halls, and on the wall were all the menus you could choose from. You could get anything you wanted, and I mean anything. And you know, the most requested thing was fresh milk, because we hadn't had fresh milk. We weren't allowed to drink any of the, <clears throat> the milk over there. Uh, we had powdered milk, but so fresh milk or steak, anything you wanted. And then the thing that they were told us to be careful of, uh, the waiters were German prisoners. They had been <coughs> working things like that for maybe a year or two. They were the happiest bunch of guys I ever saw in my life. Nobody was shooting at them. They all looked well fed, and uh, many of them had picked up you know, <clears throat> rudiments of the English language, but we were told uh, not to speak with them about anything. We were given pieces of paper to check off what we wanted, and we weren't even supposed to say hello or anything else because they were just worried that perhaps, uh, you know, some American who had seen a buddy killed, you know, would grab one of these guys or stab him with a steak knife or something. <clears throat> but anyway, that was a wonderful experience. Within a couple of days, we were sent back to Fort Devens, again, where I was inducted, and divided into groups to get uh, discharged. So, sometime in November of 45, I was a civilian. <clears throat> I don't like to use the word civilian, I like to use the word veteran, because I'm very proud to be a veteran. I'm very active in Veterans Affairs. Uh, <clears throat> I've received a lot of high honors for my work with veterans. Uh, I like to use the word patriot. When you, uh, you people study U.S. history, you read a lot about patriots. Patrick Henry, George Washington, <clears throat> you know, uh, all the uh, first presidents, the signers of the Declaration. Uh, you remember each man that signed the Declaration of Independence became a traitor to the English king. <clears throat> their houses were confiscated, their families, if possible, were imprisoned, uh, and if they were caught, they would have been hung. So they did a very, very noble and dangerous thing. And the last sentence in the Declaration of Independence we pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. How many people would do that today? So that's what our country was built on. And our country is built on the sacrifices and deeds of the United States veterans. We like to think of ourselves as a peace-loving country, but no generation since the Revolutionary War has not seen <coughs> some war going on someplace in their lives. And to you young people, uh, you know, I hope you appreciate the military. I hope you have love and respect for the flag. That flag is almost human to me. And when I see it wave in certain days, I can, I can see Washington, I can see Eisenhower, I can see all these former figures in our past, people think I'm nuts, but uh, I have no trouble standing when I'm watching a parade, watching the flag go by, saluting if in uniform. Uh, I enjoy <coughs> uh, standing and singing the national anthem at ball games and pledging allegiance in the classes. Whenever I give a lecture in a classroom, I always ask if if they will stand with me and join with me in a pledge. It's very, very important to me. Uh, respect that I learned in the service, uh, respect for my government. Uh, <clears throat> I firmly believe that our democracy is the best form of government ever devised in the history of the world. Our problems are not with a form of government, they're with some of the people that we have elected to run it. 
all the more reason to be very careful whom you elect. So, <clears throat> I could talk another half an hour about flag waving. I'm the world's greatest flag waver, but I'm going to, to stop there and let uh, Sean uh, ask me if there's anything I haven't talked about that he'd like to know. Yeah. Could you tell me about growing up before you joined the military? Just the, the growing up? Oh, okay. <clears throat> well, growing up, of course, was much different. Uh, there was no television. Very few people had telephones. Uh, my whole neighborhood, I don't think there were five automobiles. Uh, your whole world was your neighborhood. And you got to know everybody. Uh, the kids, you know, your, your peers, and also their parents. And. Uh, most of your amusements took place in the neighborhood. Occasionally you'd go downtown to, uh, <clears throat> you know, to meet people or go to the theater. There was one theater in town which, uh, you know, which changed maybe once or twice a week. Uh, so it was a very slow-paced thing. I don't think I ever, I ever left Naugatuck until maybe I was in high school. Maybe went to Waterbury. Uh, I I might have been out of Connecticut once or twice before I went in the service, but that's the way it was. It wasn't just me; it was everybody else. And it's hard for people, you know, in your vintage to understand that. And that's why uh, it's hard to understand what our early upbringing was. A school was a great social center as well as a learning center. Uh, discipline, I think, uh, was much easier to maintain because uh, parents exercised a great deal more control over their kids. It was an embarrassment for parents if their kids misbehaved. Uh, you know, such thing as the promis promiscuity, a teenage pregnancy, a family would be likely to move out of town if their daughter ever became pregnant. Today it's almost commonplace. Uh, you know, I'm not going to dwell on that. Uh, I can't make statements about it because my upbringing is much different. But if somebody was ever arrested in the neighborhood, or, well, you know, the whole it cast a negative spell over the whole neighborhood. And if uh, if Mrs. Jones down the street saw you smoking a cigarette, she wouldn't hesitate coming down and telling my mother. Uh, she probably would have to come down and tell her that because <clears throat> uh, for a while we didn't have a telephone. And the first telephone we had was on the party line. Uh, two or three people would be on the same line. And if you picked it up and one somebody else on the line was talking, you could listen to their conversation. And if it was sort of an emergency, you'd say, well, Mrs. Brown, would you get off? I need to, to call you know, my doctor. Or... The best way to communicate with somebody across town was with a letter or a postcard. You brought it to the corner post box and uh, the mailman would pick it up, bring it downtown, sort it, and then it would be delivered to Union City the next day. And then they'd answer you, they'd write a postcard and same thing, and that because you couldn't talk on a telephone. Where would people be today without a cell phone? <laughs> so <clears throat> it's, when you study history, you have to study history in the same context. When, when you see the Civil War with men marching shoulder to shoulder into enemy fire, uh, you say, wow, that's suicidal. Well, it would be today with machine guns. And But you remember in those days, <clears throat> if you could get off two shots in three minutes, that was rapid fire. You had to ram everything, seven or eight, seven or eight different things you had to do. 
and <clears throat> the enemy would get very close to you by the time you got two rounds off. And so you lined up, you lined up four or five or six deep. In the European battles, if you were fighting your first battle, you were in the first wave. If you lived through it, the next battle, you'd be in the second wave. And if you lived through five or six battles, you had good chance of survival. <laughs> <clears throat> but again, that's, you know, the, the context. Early Indian Wars, the Indians could get off six or seven arrows before you could get your second shot off, you know. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, my <clears throat> young life, uh, everything was very simple. Movies were probably five or ten cents, ice cream, same thing. Most parents made their own. <clears throat> My father made root beer, and my older sister could make good ice cream. Uh, everybody had something growing in the backyard. Uh, very little refrigeration, so my parents almost had to shop every day. And a lot of backyard baseball and football, peach basket, basketball. Uh, swimming in the old pond, you know, which now would be <coughs> ruled, you know, out of order for being polluted, but walking up in the mountain to pick berries, you know, two or three mile walk was nothing. What did your father do as a job? <coughs> well, my father really had two jobs. He was a reserve officer, uh, which meant he was gone Oh, at least two months every year in training. And uh, <clears throat> he was in World War One and World War Two. And then he worked in the chemical, which was part of the Uniroyal complex then. Uh, he worked in an office. He was a purchasing agent, uh, a little bit high, probably in the middle st strata of jobs. <clears throat> so. Uh, Probably by the time I was 10, 11 years old, he had a car. And we used to take trips here and there. <clears throat> Could do that with gasoline was 12 cents a gallon. Uh, <clears throat> so he, uh, you know, he tried to provide. But the Depression came along, everybody lost their jobs. And even uh, people like my father, who you know, had a fairly, fairly responsible job, uh, probably was told to work one or two days a week. Eventually, just about everybody lost their home. Their homes were foreclosed. They couldn't pay mortgages. <coughs> but the, uh, the good thing about it was that the bank couldn't sell the homes because nobody had any money. So the bank was sitting on hundreds of foreclosed homes and it limited the amount of business they could do because they didn't have any money either. No money was coming in. <clears throat> but we were never forced out of our homes. I guess some people were, some unscrupulous people that had <coughs> uh, had money from some source. Uh, they were able to buy up beautiful homes, estates, at, for less than nothing. <clears throat> or they could hire men who had been unemployed for less than nothing an hour to build stone walls and all kinds of structures. And so these people had, you know, had, a, had an advantage. But uh, growing up was altogether different. Now you said your uh, sister was involved with the, with the war effort. What did she do? My sister was a nurse. Out of high school, after high school, she uh, <clears throat> went to a three-year nursing program at Waterbury Hospital. And as soon as she got her RN papers, she joined the military. My father was already gone. Uh, our family had had a very heavy military orientation, so she joined the Army Nurse Corps and became a, a second lieutenant. And <clears throat> uh, before too long, I think even before I was out of high school, she was overseas. 
and working in a, some hospital. She stayed quite a while, over 10 or 12 years. Matter of fact, she met her husband, who was <coughs> a wounded uh, 82nd Airborne officer. And she met him in the hospital. So, <coughs> we, we, I never really remember too much about her, except she graduated from high school, was in Waterbury Hospital at that time. They stayed at Waterbury Hospital. They didn't come home nights, or, because after a couple of months they would they worked the hospital. The hospital was getting free, free uh, training nurses, you know. But they were <coughs> fed and housed at the hospital, so I didn't see too much of her. And once she graduated, she was gone. Uh, my older brother, I don't even think he graduated from high school. I think he left him. My father is very, very strict. My mother had the toughest job, <coughs> uh, you know, helping us grow up. And then during the war, can you imagine having, if you picture yourself as a mother, having five of your family during the war living in harm's way? All of us were, you know, <coughs> not, not too far from danger. So I think she had, she had a very tough time of it. But we all came back, and I, <coughs> I came back, and uh, I took advantage of the GI Bill of Rights. Uh, the <coughs> United States government uh, would give you a year of higher education, uh, a month of higher education for every month in the service you had. So if you had three years, that's equal to four years of college because a calendar year is 12 months and a college year is eight or nine. So I went to Springfield College and had my room board, tuition books paid for, plus $75 a month stipend. Uh, so when I got my check, I went over to the cafeteria and <clears throat> bought about 50 bucks worth the meal ticket so I wouldn't starve. And then I blew the rest of the 15 bucks a month or whatever it was. Uh, but again, it was a wonderful opportunity for me. Plus, uh, I think it was a good move for the government because I'm sure they got all that money back for me and through taxes and uh, you know, the work that I did for 38 years. And it's very hard for me to comprehend, you know, the world that I'm living in now. Uh, I have an eight-year-old grandson who <coughs> I can call over to uh, uh, to fix my VCR. And it changed. This is the way I I got rid of the the clock on my. See that? I don't like the flash, so I just. That's improvising things, right? <laughs> yeah. For an 83-year-old guy. <clears throat> I sometimes wish I had learned, you know, computer, but I just happened at a very inconvenient time. When it became almost mandatory, I was ready to retire. And that's what I wanted to do. I had two offers to, uh, to teach in junior college, and... Uh, I told them, well, let me, let me take a year off. I'm a little tired. And by the time the year ended, I wasn't ready to do anything. I was still tired. So I just pick up a few bucks here. I tutor. Or I used to. I don't anymore. But uh, I do an awful lot of volunteer work. I've been chairman of the Nordic Vets Council for 20 years, run the parades and the, all the other stuff. So, it's been a very eventful life. Uh, yeah, I consider myself very lucky in many ways. I don't want to get too philosophical on you, young guys. But. It's okay. Um, when you enlisted, were you hoping to fight in the Pacific or fight in Europe? 
I don't know if that was you know, anything I really you know, uh, felt was important. I think I, I told you earlier on what your wishes were didn't make, you make any difference anyway. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to be an infantry man like my father, and I, they, they must have thought I was nuts. But I wound up in artillery. Why, I don't know, except that it's a little bit more sophisticated maybe, or maybe that's what they needed at the time. So they got a six or seven hundred guys that just came in. Camp Edwards needs six hundred guys to fulfill their batteries up there. And so boom, that's, that's where you went. Uh, and once you are in, you have no control over your life. The good and the bad thing is you don't have to worry about what time you're going to bed, they told you. They didn't, you didn't worry about what time you're getting up, what you were going to wear, what you were going to eat. All that's taken care of for you, you don't. Uh, on the other hand, you lose your choice. The most unde undemocratic thing about the United States is the military. And it has to be that way. <clears throat> You're not going to take a vote to see who's going to charge the machine gun. That's <clears throat> so, choices are not important. Today it is. I used to do some recruiting when I was a guidance counselor, and kids today, if their grades are commensurate to what they want, they have a good chance of getting it. You know, and uh, if, uh, if an opening for what you want isn't there, they tell you to wait. Wait a couple of months, so something opens up, you know. Not during wartime, they, you know, they, they didn't call you a GI for nothing. You were government issue, and you were part of the equipment. It's, when it rained, uh, the sergeant would say, don't get your rifle wet. He didn't give a damn about you. Right? That's the way it has to be. And again, that's Again, why I say war is horrible, it should be avoided at all costs except surrender and capitulation. If we ever surrender, that's the end. You'll never get anything like we have now back. There's so many people out to just destroy us that if they ever get control of this country, it's, that's the end. And to capitulate. I feel we have done <coughs> we have done that already. I don't feel we ever should have uh, compromised Vietnam or Korea. Right now, what they're talking about, you know, over in Iraq, very hard. To, you should avoid war, as I said. But if you're into it, you're into it to win, at all costs, no matter how long it takes. And you should have the country behind you. Unfortunately, today our country is getting more and more away from that. And that's the fault of our leaders. And political parties now, I think, are more interested in themselves than they are their country. And so I think uh, I don't ever see ourselves being destroyed militarily but I can see ourselves falling apart internally. So with that, I'll end my conversation, Scott, because I, don't get me started on that. I can, I'll get my banners out and show you my battle scars. And <laughs> but again, I, as I said before, I appreciate this opportunity. I hope a lot of people have the opportunity to hear it. I hope it's been a learning experience. Uh, and I hope many young people will give some thought of joining the military. Not everybody can hide behind the military. Some people have to become military. Young college people have a chance to become officers, which what I wanted to do, but never worked out. When I graduated from Springfield College, I wanted to, I had a chance. <coughs> to go to officer's candidate school for seven weeks and come out a second lieutenant. But 
I also was engaged at the time, and my wife and I had made plans to get married in August, and she said, I'm not marrying a military man. She probably saved my life. <laughs> so, uh, it's interesting. I envy you young people. You're, uh, you're at a very exciting age. Take your profession or your job seriously, but not yourself. Okay. Well, I thank you for this opportunity.